Hello, my name is Mariah Yori. I'm a master's student at the University of Georgia, and I'm going to be talking to you today about urolithiasis in weathers and dietary considerations you can take in preventing it. Now, urolithiasis is just another term for urinary stone blockage. Pretty much any animal with urethra has the potential for getting urolithiasis, but we do see certain risk factors that make some animals more prone to it than others. Uh, such as species, breed, age, sex, and even season and environment play a role. However, out of our livestock, we have found that goats are the most prone to it of any species. And in the goat population, it's these weathers in particular. Now, weathers are like this guy. They're castrated males. In the meat goat sector, most males are castrated and slaughtered before a year of age. However, in the dairy sector, they are largely a byproduct. Most of them will go to meat, but more and more with the increasing cultural shift towards small farms, hobby farms, homesteads, we're seeing more and more of these weathers being kept as pets, being kept as companions, pack animals, or land management animals. And so with these increasing numbers of weathers, we're seeing more and more urolithiasis cases, and it is becoming an important dietary consideration for feeding these animals. All right, so what is it that makes goats and particularly weathers so susceptible to urolithiasis? Well, we have to look at their anatomy. Uh, you can see here, we have a picture of a buck. This S-shaped curve right here is the sigmoid flexure. Many animals have this. It, it, it helps with extension of the penis and breeding. And this is obviously a very good place for urinary stones to get trapped right in those little curves right there. Goats and other small ruminants, however, also have another part of them called the urethral process here at the end of the penis. It is just an extension of the urethra, usually two to four centimeters in length but it's very narrowed. It also helps in breeding, but obviously it makes for a really great bottleneck for urinary crystals to get caught. So both of these pieces of anatomy increase the risk in small ruminants. And then what makes it even worse in weathers is that they have been castrated and this leads to a lack of testosterone and often goats are castrated fairly early. So from a very early age, they've got this lack of testosterone and that keeps their urinary tract from growing quite as big as it normally would. And so the more narrow the passage, obviously the more likely it is for stones to get caught. And this is why even though does can get urinary stones as well, or cattle, it's not as common of an issue because their passages, their urethra is wider. So let's take a look real quick at what these urolists are made of. They are a crystalline matrix structure composed of both organic and inorganic materials. The organic components include things such as sugar, epithelial cells, other tissue debris, protein, and bacteria. The inorganic components are calcium, magnesium, and phosphate, and those are the important ones that we will be looking at in the diet. The makeup of each crystal, like what components, or how much of the calcium or magnesium or phosphate it is, determines which of the classifications it is. And there's four different cl classifications. Phosphatic, obviously tend to be a lot of phosphorus and magnesium. There's calcium carbonate, calcium oxalate, and silicate. These tend to be higher in calcium. Over here on the right, you can see a picture at the top of phosphatic crystals. These tend to be our most common uroliths in goats. This second picture, these star-shaped ones, these are silicate crystals. We don't see these as often in goats. Then there's calcium carbonate, calcium oxalate, here on the bottom. So as I said, early castration does play a large role in allowing the buildup of these crystals. However, 
once they're castrated, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And castration is necessary in most cases. Goats can breed as young as eight weeks old, so about two months old. So it is not uncommon for these goats to be castrated at six to eight weeks of age. So once they're castrated, you need a way to, can, to prevent the urolithiasis from occurring or to at least lower your risk. And that's where diet becomes the key component in prevention. Normally these minerals, the calcium, magnesium, phosphorus that I mentioned, when they're in excess, they're excreted through the saliva, pass through the rumen, the intestines, and then passed out through the feces. And that's how the animal rids itself of these excess minerals. However, if a diet doesn't promote a lot of saliva production, or it's just in such of an excess that even it can all come out in the saliva and it's just staying in the blood serum, that's when you have these problems. And that's when the, the minerals pass through the bloodstream and filtered through the kidneys and into the urine. And then that's when they start to create these buildup and create crystals. So our best ways of preventing this are through water intake, urinary pH, and then obviously the levels of those minerals that are passing through. Water intake is a really big cause of it because supersaturation can be considered the root cause of, I say here urolith formation, but I really more so mean urolithiasis. Uroliths are gonna form to some level, no matter what, but that supersaturation, that concentration of the urine and of all the uroliths in the urine is what's really going to block the animal. So obviously increasing water intake will help to dilute that urine, help to pass things through easier. Um, season diet and water cleanliness will all affect intake. Obviously, keeping the water clean is going to be the best way to increase water consumption. However, certain diets and even certain seasons can affect their water intake. You know, when it's cold, when it's winter, they're not going to drink as much water. Sometimes there's some diets that they're not going to want to drink as much water. They will drink more water with more forage diets. So I do have a typo down here. It should say salt. To increase water consumption, if you've already got that clean water and they're still just not wanting to drink, you can add salt to the diet and this will increase it in the winter or if your diet is not promoting a water intake on its own. And that supersaturation also plays a role in the pH. Normal pH for a goat is seven and a half to eight and a half, but that's already pretty alkaline. And alkaline pH allows for that urolith formation because it doesn't allow it to acidify, to break down those crystals and thus leads to supersaturation. And unfortunately, a lot of these uroliths like to form at pHs in this range usually no lower than 7.2. And I, we've even seen, or the research has even seen pH in goats with urolithiasis as high as 9.0. So you really want to keep that urinary pH down. More or less the only way for a producer to handle the urinary pH is through addition of ammonium chloride to the diet. And you can get it in multiple forms. You can get it just straight as a supplement. You can get it in minerals. You can get it in feed. And this will help to dissolve the crystals because it will acidify that urine. And the chloride ions actually help to inhibit crystal formation. However, long-term or high levels of ammonium chloride in the diet can lead to renal acidosis. So it's something you want to give sparingly or discuss with a vet before use. And really you wanna control that pH more so through water intake and diluting that urine. Now, when we get to diet, magnesium is the most important of those minerals that we talked about when it comes to urolith formation. 
As you can see, I've got that the buildup in the blood serum leads to a buildup in urine. You will see that on a couple other slides as well, because that is the common way that all these happen. However, magnesium is the most important because magnesium denaturalizes THP. THP is TAM horsefall mucoprotein. Uh, it exists in the urethra and the urine and is one of the main inhibitors of struvite crystals. Struvite crystals are a type of phosphatic urolith and that is what magnesium leads to those phosphatic uroliths. So if you have too much magnesium and it is denaturalizing that THP, it can't inhibit, the THP cannot inhibit those struvite uroliths. So you really want to keep, according to the NRC, a dietary limit of 0.6% or lower of the magnesium in the ration. So you want to avoid feeds such as cottonseed meal, wheat bran, dried yeast, linseed meal, or forages such as rice straw and legume haze. You'll see legume haze listed on all of my slides. Legume is high in all of these minerals that we're looking at and is just not good for these boys to be eating. So phosphorus is our next mineral. Again, buildup in the urine leads to phosphatic uroliths. You want a dietary ration again of 0.6% and feeds that you want to avoid are sorghum, wheat, corn, milo, oats, cottonseed meal, fish meal, and again, those legume haze, like I said, are going to be high in phosphorus as well. And that includes things such as alfalfa, clover. However, phosphorus is also important because you want to make sure that you have the right phosphorus to calcium ratio. These two minerals interact in a lot of different ways, including bone density, neonatal health, and as we're talking about urolith formation. And you can really have to find a specific balance because excess calcium inhibits phosphorus uptake and excess phosphorus inhibits calcium uptake. So obviously if they're in an imbalance, one of them is gonna be inhibiting the other and decreased uptake will lead to a buildup in the urine. What we have found is that a two to one calcium to phosphorus ratio is best. At the very least, you want a one and a half to one calcium to phosphorus ratio. Now, calcium also comes into play with protein. You want a lower protein diet in these boys because in these weathers, because an increased dietary protein increases urinary calcium. In the studies I read, it didn't seem that we quite understand the correlation between these two things, but most people seem to think it's due to calcium mobilization and bone resorption. But again, that increased dietary protein, it's gonna increase that urinary calcium and excess urinary calcium is gonna increase the risk of urolith formation. And these boys, these weathers, they are pretty low energy animals anyways. They're not producing meat, they're not producing milk, they're not breeding. So in general, they are not gonna need a high protein diet. So match that diet to the energy needs of the animal. We do see this because of that idea, we do see this becoming a risk with protein in our young weathers because they're growing, they do need higher protein requirements and they've got more stress on their body and their increased protein intake they are gonna have that higher risk of uroliths. So in conclusion, the things we really wanna remember when we're feeding these weathers are access to clean water, and if need be, increase dietary salt to promote water intake. You want to stay away from grains because those are typically high in protein and have some sort of supplementation of the minerals we've talked about. We wanna stay away from legume haze. Those have high magnesium, high phosphorus, high calcium, high protein, even high oxalate, which is in those calcium oxalate crystals. This was my experiment, experience with urolithiasis in weather. He was not getting grain, but he was getting alfalfa hay with all of my does, and he ended up with urolithiasis and we had to put him down. So I cannot stress enough staying away from those legume haze as well. 
really you just want them to be on a good quality grass hay diet and make sure those mineral levels are where they should be. Remembering that that's magnesium, phosphorus, and calcium are our big three. And if you do feel like they're at an increased risk and you really want something to do about it, you can use more ammonium chloride to help take care of those crystals, but you definitely need to make sure not to overfeed them. I would suggest talking to a vet or a nutritionist before adding that to the diet. And while it can be used as a treatment, only to some degree, once they have that urolithiasis. So really the best key is prevention and that is through diet. So I hope this has been helpful to y'all. Uh, thank you for listening to me.